We are live. Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to a branch of Florals. Um, I'm a Shaxi from Ontier, and uh, we have been doing this interview show for about a year now. And uh, tonight, I have with me uh, Brayden from Artemisia, and uh, I'm very thankful for you being here tonight. <laughs> You are one of my last three Laurel interviews, and um, the group that you uh, hang out with in Artemisia has been really um, helpful in this series. Uh, they really encouraged me at the beginning and have continued to uh, keep my enthusiasm up, and I just want to uh, give a huge uh, shout out and thank you to all of them. So um, thanks for being here. <laughs> I usually start these off by asking uh, how you found the SCA and um, what made you fall in love with it? So the SCA, I kind of, I, I found because a, uh, I wanted to, a fellow choir member, I guess. Uh, he said, hey, there's this medieval group, would you be interested? And I have been and still am a big fan of singing madrigals and, you know, that four part acapella stuff. It's just a lot of fun. And so I was like, sure, sure. I'll, if we can, I can come sing music, that'd be cool. And so I came to a, what was the formative meeting of what is now a college in the Outlands, uh, School, of, uh, School of Metalorum, uh, the Colorado School of Mines, and was part of the, the founding, the, went to the founding meeting um, some uh, September back in mumble mumble year, uh, 1994, I think. And uh, then just kind of, you know, started going to fighter practice and seeing people there. It's interesting because the local fighter practice was very much one of those, was in a location where you could have all of the things going on. You had extra rooms. I think it was in a National Guard motor pool building. So they had the big floor space for the fighting. And then you had rooms, you had space on the side to hang out and just chat. You had separate rooms if you wanted to work on, you know, cutting out fabric or making site tokens or playing music. And so that's kind of, you know, started hanging out there frequently enough and then went to a little tiny local event. And then we thought that we should have an event. Um, had no clue, ran my second ever event that I went to. <laughs> wow. um, it was, it, I have learned a lot since then. Um, we didn't have site tokens. We didn't have a clue, but we had a lot of good food. It was a good time. Um, and so I was hanging out with some of the musicians at the, at the big baronial fighter practice meet thing every week. And they've got recorders and they're playing and they're having a good time. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I play, but I played violin. And they're like, well, violin's period. I'm like, oh, okay. So the next week I brought it and I don't know what they were expecting, um, but I've been playing violin since I was four. So my, and my, my super pure trick is that I can sight read pretty much anything on the violin so you know they start bringing out music and I just start playing and they're like we will play this and I start playing that and let's play this and let's play this piece and and they're like oh we're you're one of us now <laughs> so, um at one point I was involved with two different music groups in the Denver area um the the quote-unquote official baronial group um and another group that actually we in the mid nineties put out a CD, which in the mid nineties was a big deal. Um, and uh, so it was, a lot, it was a lot of fun. And then, you know, enjoyed doing the music and started just finding all the other pieces of the SCA. It started just like, I'll do that one and I'll do that one. And, you know, it was just kind of fun that way. Awesome. Did you, um, so you said you started playing violin when you were four. Did you also, um, like carry that into like music studies um, out of high school or? Well, well, I, I sang in the in the college choir. Uh, the Colorado School of Mines is not a music heavy school. It's very much an engineering school. And so I had a choir scholarship. They didn't have an orchestra. Uh, so my, you know, my, my instrumental work was limited to the SCA activities and then the singing, of course, in there and in the SCA. Uh, so yeah, I, I still dabble. I've been in a few, come, you know, groups of musicians, not in the SCA since. I was in a Celtic band for a while. We had a little semi-professional madrigal group here in Boise, a couple of iterations of that. And uh, just, you know, kept 
involved over the years. It's been just a lot of fun. That's awesome. So the SDA sort of gave you a, um, a place to, to still be that musician. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. That's really great. Um, did you meet your spouse in the SDA? I did. In fact, I think you've interviewed her a few months ago. Uh, yeah, we were at, she, a mutual friend who's also in the SCA, uh, set us up. And so we were introduced at our local Raptor War, which is in a very different location than you've seen it. It was up in the mountains of Idaho. And uh, long story made short, uh, we, we kind of uh, hung out a bunch during the weekend and then, you know, back and forth. Um, and we planned to have our first date. We were going to go to a concert. You know, it's like, oh, yes, we'll do some things we like. The concert was They Might Be Giants Come to Boise on September 12, 2001. Oh. So uh, <laughs> as, as you know, that, that didn't happen because the band was stuck in New York. Uh, so, um, you know, we finally, the following June, they came and it was like, well, uh, by then she had moved to town. I was like, quite forward for a first date, you know, but <laughs> it was just kind of fun. That's awesome. Um, wow. Should we look at some, uh, some pictures? Sure, we'll go through some of these some pictures. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, it's going to pull up something weird and I'm going to have to fix it, so okay. bear with me. That's fine. Going to show us. There we go. Got it worked out. It's kind of clipped. Yeah. yeah going to scroll it up. There we okay. go. So this is not quite the earliest picture of me, but you, it's it's very close to. That's that's pretty much the garb I the, the one set of garb I had in college. I had the white shirt uh, with the metal grommets in it with the nice leather lacing right up the middle. You know, it's great. I had the sandals. Very nice, and the uh, Mark One Ren Fair pants. Uh, you know, it's good. Tevas are all purpose. Yes, yes, yep. they're, they're great. Um, those, those are the non-court shoes. I had a very nice pair of high-heeled gray boots that I picked up in the women's section at Kmart. <laughs> that were my SCA shoes at the beginning. See, I grew up in a, in a surfing community, and so I had Ugg boots, and I wore Ugg boots in the 90s as mine, and Tevas, you know, those were also mine. Yes, I've got the Jester hat, you know, that, the, but that was, that was my outfit for my first while in the SCA. Perfect. And you look like you're just having fun, and you know, really, that's all that's important. Yes, it was the homecoming parade, the SCA group, the local chapter of the college got a spot of on the homecoming parade. So I have my good friends, uh, Christoph and Tatiana behind me. He's the one who introduced me to the SCA um, as our, you know, homecoming king and queen nominees. And, you know, I just jumped on the hood of the car because it would be funny. And then what? they took exception to that. <laughs> is that like a converted Ford Fiesta or a Zoom? Yeah, a Neo Tracker, okay. which should date that picture beautifully. <laughs> I think that that must be like a Colorado car. I, I, I don't know. Geo trackers were the Geo SUV, which was not very much bigger than a Geo Metro, and we all know how small those are. But yeah. it was it was it was something. That's awesome. What was the first car that you uh, lugged camping gear to events in? Um, that would be my Ford Tempo. I had an early '90s Ford Tempo, and. I didn't have anything, right? So it all fit in the trunk. It wasn't even an issue, right? I had a backpacker's tent and I had, you know, a, a suitcase, you know, a suitcase of other things and a, a cooler that didn't have anything in it. And, you know, <laughs> the standard Mark One Pop Tarts and, and summer sausage. Awesome. Awesome. I had a Nissan Sentra and a uh, Fig Newtons instead of Pop Tarts. So, <laughs> very yeah. similar. And everyone fed me, so I didn't even get into my food. It was funny. Yep. <laughs> so this this is one of my favorite pictures of me from that time period. It's also one of my favorite pictures, SCA pictures of all time. I'm I'm not very visible. I'm in the back left there, but uh, this is one of the uh, musical groups. Uh, yeah, that's me in the back uh, with one of my other hats. I have you know, that was the same outfit but different hat. Um, but 
the people in this picture really are, are some of the more amazing people um, that I got to know. Um, uh, Master Crispin's the one of us all right there, playing recorder. Mistress Kalen is next to him. Um, Thomas in the center. And then in the front and the left is uh, Bernice of Brittany, who was one of the very, very early Keratons to start playing in Denver. And Denver had a group, I think, started in 1970. So the group's over 50 years old. And she'd been playing not quite from the beginning, but pretty darn close. And uh, she, I, I still remember one of the most magical moments. You, you have those magical moments when you're early on and you just don't realize how magical a moment that is, which is at my first camping event, which was uh, Crossroads, I think is what it was called at the time, or Fields of Gold or something. It was Labor Day weekend. And uh, Bernice and her good friend, Curiel of Wendover Cliff, who anyone from the Outlands knows Curiel is this famous, famous person from the Outlands. And they sat and chatted with me for like an hour and a half one afternoon at the event. And it was just, you know, just chatting. And I look back on it on how amazing these two people were and how much that just being there was so magical. And I didn't know it at the time. Yeah, those, those moments are really precious. And it makes me teary thinking about it. <laughs> oh. So this is the other musical group I was in. Uh, Crispin was in there, and Kaylin was in there, and then we had Frederick and Ileana and and uh, uh, Randall. And there's me in the, the hat. And you can see the leather, the very nice leather laces there. And my violin is very, very something. That 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 uh, doublet was reversible. That was the nice thing about the doublet is I could wear green side out or I could wear red side out. So I had two colors in the one doublet. It was very helpful. It was like you had two whole outfits. And the same pants. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, your heads are cut off. Heads are cut off. There so this is one of the, so this outfit's funny, but it's also one of the first pictures of my wife and I at SCA event. I would say 2001, somewhere around, yeah, 2001, <clears throat> maybe 2002. Um, that was my leprechaun outfit. We'll just call it the leprechaun outfit. Um, the leprechaun called me because I have a green hat and I have a black with green accents jerked in and I have green pants and green and white striped socks. Okay, so I'm checking your shoes for buckles and I don't see buckles, so I don't know. You yeah, know, but uh, it was it was quite funny. Um, there was a, everyone kept calling me the, the leprechaun and there was actually somebody drew up a very funny cover for our kingdom newsletter. That was a caricature of somebody picking me up and carrying me off and me with my, you know, screaming, I'm not a leprechaun, put me down. It's just hilarious. So I, I, I have the original art. somewhere on a shelf somewhere, I still have the original art, um, but it, it was fun. And yes, it was the leprechaun outfit with the bright green hat. I still have the hat. Um, none of the rest of it fits by a long way. <laughs> I understand that. All right, I have to figure out how to get to that. Okay, now we're getting into apprentices and protégés and side stories as we go. Um, so this is my first protégé, uh, Mr. Saira. And uh, the sides, so this is actually, I made her a cute little cap of maintenance, um, which has the, the tails on the back went very badly. So they looked like little ears. <laughs> but uh, I had also embroidered a pelican on the front for her. Um, and I'm happy to be wearing the Bard of Artemisia cloak. Um, here because I was, I don't remember if I was barred at the time or just serving as stand-in barred for whatever reason. I think it was, I might have been barred at that time because um, I was barred a couple of times of Artemisia. And that cloak is one of the great pieces of Artemisia history. It's the oldest piece of Artemisia regalia. And uh, it is from the beginnings of the, the principality. Um, so it's 30 years old at this point. And it's been refurbished and things many a times, but the, the standing rule is every bard embroiders their name on the inside and then adds something to the outside. Um, so as you can imagine, there is just, it's gaudy and it's just crazy. And there's all this stuff on the outside, but it has such a great history to it. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing cloak. Was and it originally made by Laurelin? Yes, Laurelin made the cloak. She actually made the cloak. Um, for the bard, and it's of the six colors. Uh, it's in the Celtic tradition because only the chiefs could wear red, so it's in the other six colors. Um, and then we had one uh, 
person who was Princess of Artemisia, who actually was Bard. And so her name is embroidered on the inside in red uh, to, to acknowledge that. But you can kind of see the bits and pieces. There's, if you look around on the internet for pictures of it, there's, at one point, there's a whole webpage dedicated to the cloak and all the pieces on it and who the bars were and what they added. And it's, it's, it's impressive. It's really cool. That's so wonderful. And I love that it's still around. Um, it's really remarkable. Um, so this is your first apprentice. Um, protege, what, actually. Protege, I'm sorry. What okay. was your journey like in, in respect to um, finding a peer and... Um... So I, I wasn't really familiar with the process when I was in the outlands. Um, and then I moved out to Artemisia because, I, and it just wasn't in my, it wasn't on, on the radar for me. And I moved out to Artemisia and I, people were talking about apprentices and apprenticing and, and squires and, and that kind of thing. And I was like, oh. Um, and so I touched base with Crispin back in the Outlands who I was still chatting with. And he's, he'd been, he kind of was a little burned out and kind of ready to take a break. And so it was not gonna be a good fit. And then, but then I started meeting, getting to know the people here more and was lucky enough to find um, Pasha who I thought I put a picture in, but I don't know where, I don't know, I think I didn't get a picture of her in there. Um, but Pasha was my Laurel and uh, I'm so pleased that to have her as my Laurel. Um, some of the things she taught me, she had some great people who guided her, some of the great people like Scruffy and, um, uh, and uh, Armand, who really, who really showed that that there's a level of politics in the SCA, but it's not necessarily bad politics. You can use your insight and influence to enhance it and raise the game. And you know, through her insight in that, that really helped me better understand how I could help others and motivate others. And it's it's it continues to serve me well. She's definitely a good person to take that line from. Um, yeah, Scruffy was uh, an amazing person that way. He, he um, really turned his gamer's mind toward the SCA and very interesting person. Anyway, um, so this was your first protege. Um, were you Pelican or Laurel first? I was a Laurel first. I got my Laurel in 2003 and my Pelican in 2000. Seven, uh, yes, 2007. Um, but uh, I just, in the beginning, I didn't really have any drive or find the right click to find anybody to take under my wing, literally or figuratively. Um, but then Sayera, we just kind of clicked and it was like, hey, you know, she's like, I don't understand what a protege does or what's the point of having, and, and at the point it was interesting at that time, there's a long discussion about what's the point of being a pelican with a protege? And I think that Sayer and I, we found really the, the whole point behind it, which is I knew being the peer and in touch with people where the help needed to be. And I just needed to let her know where she could direct her efforts. Um, and so she did that admirably and sister pelican now. So yeah. Um, but it, it was really nice to see her grow into a, I want to help into a, from, from the, I want to help, but I don't know how to, I'm going to go help now and it's going to be effective. And I see this thing that needs to be, so I'm going to go take care of that. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So. This is my second protege, which was kind of a joke of fun. And then the story, which is the other picture, which is why I'm in drag. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, so, Isabel, that's just Isabel, uh, had always wanted to be a protege. Always, 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 always wanted to be a protege. And so, finally, um, I offered, I was like, this was the last event before I stepped down as Baron, um, where I was like, okay, I'm making a protege. And I had a little garter that I put on her arm and she went out to dinner with everybody else. And she's so excited, she had to be a protege. And then that evening in court, they announced she was putting on vigil for her pelican. <laughs> <laughs> and she turns and points at me and very loudly and yells, you suck. 
So <laughs> that's been my protege for three hours. Um, but uh, it, it, it was it was fun. And uh, but she got to be a protege because she always wanted to be one. It was her last chance to be one. Uh, but the other story of this is Isabel was constantly doing amazing things in the Baron. She was the Reeve and, you know, she slept next to the Reeve table so that no matter what time you showed up at a camping event, Reeve was open. Um, and so she, she was just very, very helpful. So we were writing as we were Baron and Baroness, writing award recommendations to the King and Queen. And we said, well, we should make her a saint, you know? And, you know, you write, you write up, you, we wrote up a big long list of award recs and then we come back to it and go back and forth. And we just left it in, she should be a saint. And we send it off to the King Queen. So I get this phone call. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was uh, Duchess Tiana, who was queen at the time. And so I saw this same thing. And so we, we, we talked about it. And it developed into the story about these miracles of St. Isabel. And so she got our Kingdom Service Award, the, the Golden Pillar of Artemisia. But it's written out, listing out these miracles and not making her a saint, because we don't do that. But then celebrating that October the... 23rd, 22nd, as celebrating the feast of St. Isabel. So, and so, of course, you have to have a miracle play about the feast of St. Isabel. And so that is me playing the part of Isabel uh, in her dress uh, there on the right. <laughs> awesome. So this is my first apprentice, Elias. Um, Elias, uh, he came to, he approached me and was like, so you're a Laurel, you're a Laurel I, I greatly respect. And I want to learn how to do the, I do art, but I want to learn how to share my art and make it known. I was like, all right, what do you do? And so, I mean, he's, he's a very, he's a high end rapier fighter. He's, I think, won more kingdom rapier championships than anyone else. Um, so, and he's my height, which is really funny because uh, when I went to his master of defense ceremony, um, you know, I talked as the Laurel, uh, makes sense. And I said, so Elias is short, which is a joke. It's a running joke amongst all of his friends. Cause if you see him with all of his provosts, he comes up to their shoulders. I mean, he's, he's like five, 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 six. So am I, you know, and it's just really funny. And, but he still wins and it's not because of arm length because he knows what he's doing. So, but he also does pottery exceptionally well. Got some amazing pottery from him. It's good having him as an apprentice, let me tell you. In fact, these amazing mugs, um, a couple of uh, my household, he made a set of mugs like this for the household. And uh, you can see it's got, you know, very pretty, but- uh, Here, I'm gonna stop share so you so we can see that. Okay. So yeah, so this is the, the mug. He made a set of mugs for our household with, uh, and he did all the art. He does calligraphy and illumination and he does pottery. So his illumination skills serve well on pottery, <laughs> let me tell you. But uh, so, yeah, he does pottery, he does collection illumination, he does rapier. And so working with him really helped him grow his art and get his, his, his image out there. Um, but that's us um, signing the contract because I do an apprenticeship uh, a lot like the business contract version, the, the, the English traditional way. We have a uh, contract and duplicate. And we both sign both pieces and cut it. And he gets half and I get half. And then at my apprentice's laureling ceremonies, I take the contract, I take their half, I've got my half and I tear it up. So just, and then, you know, I keep, but I keep the pile separate so that I give them their torn up pile back. So they've got it. I'm going to keep mine too, because it's kind of cool. Um, so, but that wasn't the only thing going on that day. That was the Kingdom Arts and Sciences Championship. Um, and I won. That's the Kingdom Arts and Sciences Champions uh, medallion and, and collar there on the right. I was wearing. It was a good day. Um, that was the second time I won Kingdom Arts and Sciences. Um, so things have changed since then. But at the time, it was five items in three different grand categories. And so the first time I won was in three different categories. And so I felt I wanted to challenge myself. So I did five items in five categories. And so it was very different, it was harder uh, on me and uh, it was victorious, but you know, I, I kind of stretched my, my abilities and did a lot more. Very cool. Um, when you step down as champion, do you get, um, is it tradition in your kingdom to do like a, 
oh man. <laughs> uh, for example, in on tier, when you step down as heavy, he uh, heavy champion, you get uh, the lion sword of on tier. We get, um, so the, the 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 champions that step down the crown, they don't have to give it, but they 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 do give to especially the champions are there or whatever. What they call a quad libet, which is kind of a, a a medallion with a big Q on it. Quad libet is uh, Latin, literally for singamajig. Um, so we get a singamajig uh, for having served as a kingdom champion. So of the there's the obviously there's the king's champion, queen's champion, rapier champion, um, bard. Equestrian champion, turn weapons champion, archery champion, shield of chivalry. I'm missing one. Arts and sciences. Did I say that? Yeah. Um, um, I'm sure I'm missing others, but that's kind of the the the, the bulk of them. But yes, when you step down, if you've been more than just a placeholder, a name on a list, um, the crown, especially if you're there at the court where you step down, uh, the crown is mindful to give you a quad limit. And that's a universal thing across all the championships. Yes. That's really cool. I, I love inner kingdom anthropology. We have a, a separate one for each of our many, many championships, which is also cool. But I like I like that um, the universal award kind of evens the playing field. I like that. What I do like is the the arts and sciences champions only wear the medallion. Um, the others and and so and the king so the the chain of aids. The king has a, a chain, the queen has a chain, and the king's champion has a chain, and then the arts and sciences champion has a chain. None of the other champions have a chain of A's with a, with a medallion or anything on it. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. That is super cool. And I bet now that somebody's going to uh, make a chain of A's for all the champions. I don't know. You got to get the you got to get the the mold for that A, and I don't remember who did those A's. Oh, maybe they'll make a new mold. <laughs> That's her job. I got a wife for those. You know, so. <laughs> so this is uh, my second apprentice, um, uh, Sarah, and uh, it was it was interesting because Sarah and I started talking about her being an apprentice at fifty years, um, and it was it was just kind of a sort of chatting about it, what she wanted, and we talked about her goals, which was to she was she was at the time very much felt like she was in the shadow of her mother and her mother's work. And I was like, okay, we'll make you into the artist that is the renowned artist. And so there she's got her half of contract and she's got her belt. Um, but uh, it, it was interesting because in both cases, these are artists that we don't share common skills. And I'm not there to teach them how to do their skill. I'm there to teach them how to know about their skill and how to share their skill and how to comport themselves as a peer whose skills are art related. Um, and so, you know, uh, obviously, well, there's uh, uh, Laurel, my sister, Laurel, but she'll always be my apprentice and we still chat and go to, to lunch on occasion and and it's, it's a good time. It's a lot of fun. Um, since she grew up in the SCA, um, was it, I mean, you already kind of said that it was a different journey with her because uh, she was trying to get out of the shadow of her mom, of what she thought was the shadow of her mom. But between the two, um, was it a, what were some of the differences between someone who, who grew up and, and really had already um, absorbed the essence of the SCA? Well, oh, and, and we had some very good conversations about where she was versus what pieces of her image um, would make what is considered a peer. And, you know, it's interesting because she ended up picking up a Seneschal job for her shire before she moved to Boise, she lived in Bozeman and she was Seneschal. She's like, I'm just worried that being Seneschal is going to kind of derail my efforts on the Laurel track. I said, it's really not because it shows that you are a peer of the realm if you if you do the job and do it well don't just you know you know write it off and mail it in but do the job and she did a good job very good job she grew the group um quite well and uh, you know but it helped broaden her the perception of her as a responsible adult and it's one of the pieces that definitely got her out of that shadow and 
and really show that she is her own person and not just the cute little daughter of her mom. Right. And that was, right. that was, I think it was very good for her. Yeah. And, and a part of the SCA on her own. Yes. And I'm pretty sure she would never, ever want to do Seneschal ever again. And if I suggested it, she'd hit me with something. <laughs> it's not an easy job. No, I, I still remember a long time ago, one of my one of my good friends in Kerta, which tells you how long ago this was, um, who was Bronial Seneschal before he became Kingdom Seneschal. She's like, do you like the SCA? I said, yes. Do you enjoy playing in the SCA? I said, yes. He said, then don't be Seneschal. Yeah, I was Seneschal within my first five years of playing, and that maybe was not the best Ooh. thing in the world for me. I have thus far avoided that job. And I get trapped with it every once in a while. So this is my current approach. For whatever reason, I end up with just kind of one apprentice at a time. Um, and this is Malkin, Her Excellency Malkin. She's actually uh, Mistress Malkin. She's a pelican. Uh, she was Baroness of Griffin's Lair. And uh, they stepped down in August. And then they moved to Vernal, Utah. But uh, Malkin, um, she's one of those people who's has got a lot of talent and she's like why do you want me as your apprentice because i approached her i'm like because when you are successful i want cre some credit for it <laughs> <laughs> she's just this great individual as a per as a human and uh it's, it's fun to see her work on her art she does stained glass and she does a nice job of that um but she also does you know a bunch of everything else um and so you know tablet weaving and making outfits and yes this that and this and that so on the, on the other half of the picture, you see that's a hard to read copy of the contract that we both signed. And then there's the apprentice belt. And then as a gift for her, um, yeah, you can see there it is. Um, so she's got the belt and the garter um, because sometimes, you know, it's, wearing the belt just doesn't go with your outfit, it's fine. Um, and then I was uh, two years ago, it's just two years ago this month, um, uh, my wife and I uh, were on a trip to Europe. We did part of the trip in Italy and part of the trip in Switzerland. And so while we were in Italy, I got a green ring made of Murano glass as a nice little, sometimes even the garter isn't what you need, but you know, it's this little token piece. And so, yeah, it's a real Murano glass green belt, as it were, that uh, she was definitely tickled to have. So when you... Um when your uh, apprentices uh, graduate on and become laurels, do they keep uh, their apprentice belt to share with their apprentices or do you take it back? No, um, I take it back, but I then make one for them. So it's convenient that um, both Elias and Sarah, uh, I, I happen to know a pewterer, as you well know. <laughs> and so vigil tokens, uh, the, the Vigil tokens for their their vigils are, are usually something involving their their device, and so I take one of those because it just happens that they happen to be just about the right size to fit on a belt, and I put it there on the tongue of the belt, or on the on the tip of the belt, and so they've got their own apprentice belt with their label on it, for them to then use when they're ready to take apprentices. Now, neither Elias nor Sarah have yet taken an apprentice, but they have a belt for it, so that's good. That's super cool. Yeah, Elias was uh, unfortunate enough that uh, he was elevated uh, for his laurel in August, and then the following March, he was made Master of Defense. We didn't get to really enjoy and embrace being a laurel. Mm. He's got several provosts. Um, in fact, one of his provosts, a few of his provosts have become, um, uh, as I like to call them, defensors or oodlings. Um, and one of their in one case, their provost has now become a mistress of defense. And so uh, as far as lineage, I'm the great, great grandpa. So, you know. That's kind of cool. Uh, ah, so Juliana and I were fortunate enough to be the Baron and Baroness of Arnhold, seventh Baron and Baroness, and had a really good time with it. Um, it it was kind of at, that, at the right point in our SCA careers where, you know, we were ready to do the job and had the right skills at the right time. And really, it was, it was enjoyable. Um, there I am in the Bronio Coronets in different iterations of it. And um, 
it was it was a lot of fun. There were a few major challenges. Um, so we it was the first week of September in 2007 was quite the week. Um, we found out we were going to be Baron and Baroness. Uh, we got the phone call from the King and Queen because the, there was also the polling. We uh, later that week found out we were expecting our daughter. And that Saturday, Juliana got surprised with her laurel. So it was it was quite the week. <laughs> so That's a lot of roles to take on at once and wrap your head around. Although I will say, for those who are worried about being a parent and being baronage or ruling or whatever, when they're in larval stage, it is so easy to take care of them um, by comparison to toddlers. It's not that they're easy. They're just easier than when they're mobile. When they're not mobile, um, it, it, it was very much a doable thing, um, but it was good times. It's better to do it earlier or after they turn 12. <laughs> yes. So, but yeah, there was my, my daughter, she definitely was handed around and had a good time. And she was, as you'll see in the next set of pictures, adorable. Um, that's uh. at a crown tournament. Um, but yeah, there she is. <laughs> and yeah, we took her to all the stuff and we had a good time. <coughs> um, the other picture, while I was barren, so my college group was still going strong. And so I made a point of uh, trying to, and there I am, uh, trying to meet up with them and do things with them. This is at Estrella. I went to Estrella as Baron and found the, the fighting corps of the college on the field and managed to get in for a group picture, which is kind of cool. Um, and of all the people who have graduated from the college, through the, or been a, a member of the college, I'm the highest on the OP because no one's won crown yet. <laughs> Sir Ronan will someday, and I will move down the list. But for the moment, um, I, I'm currently the the top of the OP for Skull of Metal Orange. I was gonna say somebody's gonna take that as a challenge. I hope Ronan wins. I'll be there for coronation. It'll be great. Uh, so <laughs> I had to include, that is me blowing up an inflatable sheep. Uh, um, and with uh, Fernando, uh, so Sunny is chicken. It's, it's a sheep, trust me, it's a sheep. So once upon a time, there's a funny story here. Um, the Baron of Laxalan and the Baron of Griffin's Lair were arguing about stealing of sheep. And I wish I could say this was my idea, but it was totally my wife's idea, which was if they're probably worried about possessing sheep, um, we will give them all the sheep. And so in a great secret thing, and this is, I'm, I'm reiterating, this is her credit, this this is her great idea. I just was following along. We got the barony and friends and stuff like that to compile hundreds of small sheep and bring them to Uprising Court to hand over to the Baron of Laxalan to get over his problem with missing sheep. Well, the Baroness had taken ill, so he wasn't in court. They had to go home. So we were fortunate enough that the Crown Prince was from Loxalan, who happened to be Sean. <laughs> and so if you want to see the whole video, we don't have to watch it now because it's about seven minutes long. Um, go to YouTube, type in Sheep Rising, and prepare to laugh. <laughs> and you, can, and you, you, can't, you can't make this up. It's, it's just funny. But there's, yes, we are inflating sheep behind court, before court, for Sheep Rising. And he, uh, he, is, uh, he was very tolerant and... Uh, was a very good sport about that he, he was a very good sport about it yes <laughs> he said because he was prince he was a good sport because it was hilarious if it was king no don't guess the king that way but the prince oh yeah <laughs> and even to this day the word sheep comes up and you see sean going no sheep uh, maybe maybe uh alpacas is the next thing he needs to be bombarded <laughs> with <laughs> no, so, ah, now we're getting into you know, the thing that I got recognized as a Laurel for. So music, um, I, I've been, like I said, I've been playing violin since I was four. And then I realized that I've been playing that viola da gamba now for over 20 years. Wow. Um, I didn't realize that until I was like, well, no, because, um, which is a funny story because for a while there, I was one of the top viola da gamba players in Idaho um, because I was 
pretty much the only field other combo player in Idaho. Um, I actually got to, at, at the start, I borrowed the Boise State University, their mu early music department had one. Um, and so I learned on that instrument. Um, and uh, it's it's behind me, over, over my left shoulder, uh, that instrument there. It's, it's a lot like a cello and a lot not like a cello. It uh, has six strings instead of four. It's voiced very similarly. The range of the instrument is very similar. Um, but it's got frets and it's got a flat back and a much more mellow sound. It's, it's fun to play in a space because the way the instrument is built, I don't hear it very much, but the, the farther away across the room you are, the more you can hear it. I remember being at a place where they're doing some dancing in a gym and I was sitting in the corner just playing and there are people dancing on the other side of the gym. They're like, you're very loud. And I'm like, I'm catty corner. I'm, I'm diagonally the far side of this gym. They're like, no, it's carrying. It's kind of funny. Um, and then, but violin is my, my first love and still my go-to weapon when it comes to music. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a picture taken at a Queens tea at uprising where we just had drummers going and I just broke out the violin and I started improv middle Eastern music and it was tons of fun. And I ended up repeating that at the Outlands Hofla at Penzik one year. And it's just tons uh, of fun to just kind of sit there and noodle around in a key and just watch the dancers just just embrace the extra music that's going with the, the drum and beat. That's a lot of fun. Do you want me to play a few seconds of it? Uh, sure. Okay, let's see if I can figure it out again. <laughs> what's going to work? Oh, it went to Facebook this time. <laughs> It was, it was fun because it was definitely improv. I really didn't know what I was going to play until I was playing it. And it just, it was one of those great moments where everyone's just like, that's, that's, that's a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that the person filming that was, was talking about the lady dancing. Well, because Mir is an amazing dancer. I won't take it away from Mir, but yeah, the music is a lot of fun. Um, but also singing, um, so I don't know if we play this one. This is me singing counter tenor, uh, actually for the first arts and sciences competition that I won. Um, um, so yeah, I sing counter tenor. And, it, and the side story here is that John Dowlin, or Doolin, depending on how you pronounce it, wrote all of his music in counter tenor, uh, just about all of it. So those who are musicians out there that are like, oh, what's out there that's actually in counter tenor this period, you know, all of John Dowlin's stuff, uh, is written in countertenor because it's it's written in the alto range, but it's talking about the unrequited love of women um, and how he is so sad, and which is really funny because he's a very happy. He was he was always considered a happy guy, so he has very sad words to a lot of his songs. But yeah, this one is definitely uh, a good example. <laughs> Should I play it? Well, sure, you can play a little bit of it. Okay. Um, and uh, yes, I, I had a friend who did the accompaniment. But I'm okay, to okay. Abroad, so it's my small sorry but about the ad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was a long time ago. My goodness. Oh. So yeah, it's a recorded cello accompaniment.
sure when to stop. I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, that's all good. You're good. Okay. All right. So yeah, chapter tenor at its finest. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I do. I mean, I sing normal, normal tenor stuff too. But tenor, tenor was, is, has been a lot of fun uh, because it's it's just different, and it, because there's a lot of period music for it, it makes it very straightforward to go find. You know, I'm going to sing a counter tenor piece. So, so for somebody like me who has no idea what counter tenor means, what does counter tenor mean? <laughs> okay, so your voice parts, you have sopranos who are typically the top line and sing the melodies and whatever. You have altos, which are the women who do not sing the high notes. Um, and then you have tenor, baritone, and bass, which are kind of the three ranges for men, uh, tenor being the highest of the three. Well, counter tenor is where men will sing much higher than the standard tenor range, very much into the alto even into the soprano range, into the treble clef for those who are music, you know, and it's not all bass clef there. It's very much treble clef, uh, much higher than normal. Um, in fact, my voice teacher for many years is also is a professional counter tenor. And so uh, I, I started learning tenor from him and then we went on to counter tenor and I really enjoy it. That's really cool. Um, that is, those are not notes every, um, every person can hit. <laughs> nope, nope. Some guy's going out there, nope, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> okay, and then there's this really lovely piece with your daughter. So this one is my daughter, it was actually last year during, it was just a year ago, uh, my daughter entered in the baronial arts and sciences. And so it's her playing oboe with me accompanying. But it's, it's kind of cool. The yes, the little redhead baby in the previous picture is the one playing over there. And so, not surprisingly, our children, since we sing and play and do all this stuff around the house all the time, are very musical. And That's so, wonderful. I, I love kids' performances. It it makes me teary to just just see these little people developing into these artists. It's so exciting. So you know, not just music. What's funny is once I be, once I was elevated to being a Laurel, um, it kind of gave me a, somewhere in my mind a green light to try new things. Um, and so this is Black Works, and it's a funny story about the Black Works. So Isabel, my a protege, was queen and for, for Australia, and she wanted to have black worked or beaded or decorated veils for each queen coming to Australia. Wow. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what black work is, but I'll, I'll try it out. So I got a four and a half by four and a half foot piece of linen and proceeded to black work the entire edge of it in tiny little stitches. Um, I used, I think, 200 meters of black silk thread and it took three months of work. Um, but I learned how to black work very well. And so after that, I was like, oh, I can do this. And the, the, the challenge I've always had is I have an art and I can share it and it's dynamic. And then once I've shared it, it's, it's gone. Uh, yeah. um, but having something that I can give somebody as a gift that they have. hat. So when Isabel was queen the second time, um, I offered to make a pair of blackwork sleeves for because she was going to make the pelican dress, the from the Elizabeth, the Queen Elizabeth pelican dress, mm -hmm. and so I offered to do not sleeves like Elizabeth has in there, but definitely sleeves with with elements that pertain to Isabel and being queen. She has dragonfly on her arms, and she was queen of Artemisia. So in amongst this whole thing, and she's there's her second reign, so there's a laurel wreath because she's a laurel. There's dragonflies. There's Tudor roses. There's strawberry leaves. There's griffins. 
um, holding roses. Um, so it's just, you know, and it took about a few months to finish both sleeves. Um, but you can see it's kind of worked up, but it, yeah, basically it's the cuff at the bottom all the way up to the collar at the top that comes together. Wow. And then um, the one on the right is the white scarf for now Master Killian when he got his white scarf. Um, uh, Killian has crossed swords on his device, so I did that and then have two griffins holding a white scarf. So it's, as, as he says, it's his pretty dress white scarf. I took a black work class once and the teacher told me that I was not suited to the work <laughs> and I should never try it again. <laughs> so, and, and there's a couple of different ways to do black work and they're both <laughs> documented in, you know, in actual extent examples. One is to count the threads of the fabric and do kind of a very grid, it's like cross stitch on steroids. And the other is to pencil it in and just stitch over it. And you can still find penciled lines on extent pieces. So both are correct. Um, I count the threads, which gives you an idea of how insane it is. Um, if you think about that, that means I counted all the threads up and down those sleeves. <laughs> did, did, you're like, what? Yeah, pretty much, that's what I did. Um, but then um, the next picture kind of identifies a lot more of what I'm doing uh, that's much smaller. So cup covers are, are much more, uh, transportable and giftable item. So that's a cup cover. Um, I've done a lot of creating my own patterns. And so the labyrinth in the center is, is of my own making. And it's actually is, if you follow it, you go all the way around, all the way around to the Minotaur, um, but it's actually a labyrinth there. And then another pattern I had a lot of fun with on the right there are these blue boxes. What are those from? I don't know, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, yes, I've done a couple of iterations of TARDIS cuffs and you know, it, and it, it, it's great. You know, they're very simple. They're you know, fun. And then people wear them. People are like, oh my gosh, that's awesome! I'm like, yeah, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> I, I love that kind of cross pollination um, because it, at first glance, it looks like it's a it's a beautifully crafted, oh, yeah. right, very period item, and then it's, it just kind of sneaks up on you. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I think it helps people who are not totally all about the history feel a little bit more included. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing for sure. It, it, it's, it's a way to have fun with it, right? The yeah. creative kind of the anachronisms. Yeah, and we need, to, we need to do more of that. So this um, was another cup cover that I forget who it was that they had a five-pointed star on their device. And so I put that into the cup cover. And then the, the one on the right is, a lot, is, is you got a fun little story. It's got the, I, I like putting that labyrinth in the center just because it makes a great center to it. But so this was for our king and queen going to Australia. We've evolved to the point now where you give gifts to a kingdom. Yeah. Right. And so we had Drakenval. So the goal was to give a bunch of really nice gifts to the king of Drakenval that he could then fly home with. And so this cup cover has the red trees from the Drakenvald device that I created for there. And then in the corners, and it's kind of hard to see, um, is a very interesting mosaic pattern that I found on a trip to Israel in the, mosa in the Roman mosaics. Um, in Caesarea, in fact, that exact pattern is in the mosaics. It's kind of hard, to, it's, it's, it's very tiny, so it's hard to pick out, but uh, I found that pattern, in my, I'm like, oh, that would be a really cool blackwork pattern because the, the way the, the pieces almost touch and just kind of intermix. And so sure enough, that's that's what I use for the corners to kind of make it a fun little cup uh, cover. So the, the final thing of blackwork is those pants. Um, so in the Janet Arnold 4, there is, um, an example, an excellent example from about 1630, I think, of somebody with, some, with a pair of Venetian breeches that are completely covered in embroidery. And I'm like, I want to do that. That sounds like fun. Now, most people think I'm kind of crazy. But what I don't want is to not wear the pants for 20 years um, and then just briskly never wear them. 
So what I did is I designed these pants and I've got them here and I'll show you in a second. Um, that it's all things growing, literally growing up the pants. So as I put in more, it kind of grows up the pants. And so you can see there, um, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, on this side, you can see that there's a grapevine and I, I've got, you don't have to zoom in. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. just got them, you can okay. stop sharing and I will, I will show them off here. Sure. Um, there we go. So here are the pants. Um, so, you know, we've got, we started with grapevines. You can kind of see the grapevines there that go from bottom to top. And then um, I put grapevines on the back. You can find them. So they're, they're on the back too, because you got to have something on the back. And then I did ivy on the sides. So there's this ivy along the sides here. Um, I realized I needed a cod piece. <laughs> Those are cod. And then the family jewels, because you got to have the family jewels. Um, then um, down here, I've put a sprig of artemisia on each side. Where, where is, there is a sprig of artemisia. Um, and then now I'm growing in the hops. Let me get the hops in here. So you can see, I'm still, as you can see, I'm actively working on putting hops in. But uh, so, you know, it's just kind of filling in the pants as they go. And as, as, as the hops grow in, you know, uh, the, the hops will fill in here and they'll fill in on the other side and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do next. So those are just kind of, it's, it's, I don't wear that outfit often because just coat hardies are really comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll wear it every once in a while, especially when I've accomplished something more on the pants. And will they ever be done? Who knows? But uh, the way they're built, they're the lining, but there's a hole in the lining at the bottom of each uh, legging, le each leg, so they can go in and keep black working. And so, yeah, every, every so often I'll, I'll when, once the hops are done, I'll probably break it out for an event or two and be like, all right, the hops are done. And then I got to figure out what I'm going to do next. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that somebody will, will fight for me and crown and then I can put a, a roses on it, you know, that'd be fun. That would be awesome. But as I'm one of the few people in the SCA who's never even ever put on armor, um, chances of me winning crown are not very good. <laughs> Well, you should start actively uh, recruiting somebody to. Uh, to I've, 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 I've got, you know, I've, I've got a bromance going. We'll see if it goes anywhere, but, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, should we go back and finish the pictures? We can finish the pictures. Okay. Those are, those are them pants. One of the more recent things I've started doing is playing with food. So my, my philosophy on the essay has kind of evolved as it, it wants to do over the years. And I'm really more interested in the everyday things of people much more than I used to be, you know, because it's not all grand feasts and court guard. You know, you didn't, that wasn't what you wore every day. It's great to look at, it's fun, but it's not utilitarian. Um, so this is part of my long running making of cured meats. So on the left there is homemade salami. Um, early on in the process, it hasn't dried and, and contracted yet. And on the right is uh, duck breast prosciutto, I'm making prosciutto there um, out of duck breasts, which um, is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, just making different meats. And then the next picture is brassola which is a Northern Italian cured meat. Um, it actually, so uh, an example, so salami is dry cured and prosciutto is dry cured, but brasola is steep, is soaked in wine and then salt cured and then dry cured. Wow. So on the left, you can see that it's, it's right after it, uh, it's tied up for its hanging right after it's come out, um, after it's wrap. And then on the right, I've cut it open. You can kind of see a lovely velvet color in the center. Um, we have a source in town that sells beef tender, whole beef tenderloins for a very reasonable price, like seven, eight dollars a pound. So if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to go get a whole beef tenderloin. And so this stuff is rich. It is such an intense flavor that eating it by itself, even in small shaved off pieces is quite the experience, but putting it with anything else, a cracker, 
or a piece of cheese. And it's just delightful. It's got black pepper and rosemary and you know salt and and it just got wonderful flavors. Yes, the running joke, of course, is, you know, have you tried braiding salami? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, of course, we've got the meat and you can kind of see slices of here. So this was at the Art of Mission 20 year. We got a group of us together. It's like, you know what? We're going to make a sandwich. We're going to make a sandwich from scratch. Um, and so we got a group of us together. I did the meats. Um, we have a, a, a gentleman who does cheese and he made the cheese. We had somebody else do the, the rolls. We had somebody else do the sauerkraut. Somebody else do the mustard. And so we made a sandwich from scratch. And the documentation has all the important parts and a whole lot of farce in it. Um, and uh, if anyone ever wants to read it, it's, it's just designed to be funny and not serious because we're not trying to, quote unquote, win any arts and sciences. We're trying to have fun with this and eat a really, really, really good sandwich because it's got homemade salami, homemade prosciutto, homemade brisola, homemade mustard, homemade sauerkraut, homemade cheese, mozzarella, I think Rook made mozzarella, homemade mustard on a homemade bread. Wow. It was a really good sandwich. And that bread looks fantastic. Oh yeah, it was all, it was fun. It was really good. The other thing I like doing a lot of is Middle Eastern food, um, which is part of my next big project um, that I'm working on with a friend of mine from the Outlands, Guinevere. Uh, so what we've got here is a couple of tagines going. And a tagine, for those who are not familiar with tagines, a uh, tagine is the ceramic predecessor to the Dutch oven. Um, and it used to make some amazing foods in the tagine. Love tagine cooking. Um, but Middle Eastern cooking, especially North African, uh, is very much a refrigerator-free kitchen because it's hot and you don't, um, which, which is part of a greater project that I've got going with, with Winnevere, as I mentioned, to do a coolerless camping kitchen for SEA events. Because with just a little planning, you know, farm fresh eggs and a few other items, um, pretty much everything you can bring is shelf stable enough to go camping with. And then, you know, all of the, you can still eat well. We're, we're coming up, you know, a menu and recipes. It's not just one thing. It's, it's, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of options there. Because really, if you think about it, they lived without coolers in camp for a few thousand years. Right. So, you know, would it be great to go camping and not have to worry about the cooler and the ice and refilling the ice and did the stuff stay cold enough and that kind of thing. And so it's getting closer, kind of a back and forth thing on it. But, you know, someday it'll be, you know, showing up at camping events and we'll have all the yummy food, but the only thing the cooler is for is to keep the beer cold. Wow, that's really cool. I love that. Micrography. So I can't draw. I will be the first to say that I can't draw, but the idea of doing scrolls is cool. And so in a lot of the Hebrew texts, Jewish texts in Hebrew, they do a lot of micrography in the, in, in, in the in shapes of, of things in the periphery. And so I'm like, you know what? That would make a fun scroll. And so the one on the left is actually the very first micrography scroll I ever did. It was a, a maple leaf scroll for uh, Her Excellency Sumeya. And what, what I do is I'll take an image and then instead of the lines in it, I'll put the words in it. So as you can see, they're tiny, tiny words. So that, um, and if you, you zoom out and you see the other one, there's, there's, there's a pencil there to give you an idea of how big that is. So these are tiny, tiny letters. And, but there's, with such tiny letters, there's such a huge canvas to work with. Um, I've had lots of fun putting all sorts of fun extra text, because scroll text isn't that long. And you can make a long scroll text, but it's only going to be like a third or half of that. I've put the recipe for chocolate chip cookies into one. I've put a whole bunch of knock-knock jokes into one. Um, there was one where uh, it was a, a laurel, I think it's coming up, it's a laurel scroll, that I listed out every single group in the kingdom that the king and queen ruled over. Uh, um, so this... So this is the local, so th this is uh, an, an AOA. So in, in Artemisia, um, the, when you get your, AO, your, uh, your award of arms, you get an A, which is just like the A's on the chain of estate, chain, this, this chain of estate. And so I did it 
as an AOA scroll with the tiny text in it. Um, and then the one next to it is the Vin Willen Keeper, which is the Baronial Service Award here. So it's a windmill, Vin Willen Keeper. And so that, that's text. <coughs> um, so yeah, the one on the left here is, yes, I, I teamed up with somebody who can draw and did the illumination in the center of the laurel scroll here. Um, but that's uh, Morgan. In fact, it was Morgan when he was taking, he did the illumination there. Uh, for somebody who was a weaver getting a laurel for their weaving. But, you know, I did the laurel wreath, which is the text. And then the Arts and Sciences Champion, remember the Arts and Sciences Champion medallion that I had? Well, I did the Arts and Sciences Champion scroll um, that year. And Heloise, uh, who, you know, uh, part, of, part of the uh, household group, uh, won. So that's, she now has a scroll. What I really like about the micrography scrolls is, you know, when we get sc scrolls these days, to get it framed, you're, you're spending a lot of money to get it framed decently. But when these scrolls are, you know, three by five, four by six, it's a lot less expensive to get that framed. I think the, the most enjoyment I had out of it was I was at somebody's house for a party and they had one of the scrolls that I did on the bookcase, you know, in a little frame, just standing up on the bookcase. I'm like, that, that, that's, that's the idea. Um, one of the most hilarious ones was the Baronial Fighting Award I did to be the same size as your fighter's authorization card. So you could laminate it and put it in with a fighter's authorization card. Perfect. Perfect. Um, it's, a, it's a censored box we can move depending on how adult we want to be for this one. Um, so this, it's pretty up to you. I, I put it in here so you could move the box if you like. But I I'll how to move the box. Uh, because I want to see what's under there. <laughs> well, let me tell the story. So okay. Timmer, Timmer is a great guy, but Timmer is very Timmer. And so Timmer was getting the pillar, the golden pillar of Artemisia award, the service award from the kingdom. And so I'm like, oh, Timmer needs something inappropriately obnoxious. And so I went to, I, I did go to the king first. I'm like, all right, I want to do that. I have the scroll idea, but I want permission first. And he's like, oh, sure, go for it. I'm like, all right. Uh, so I learned that the Japanese art of enhancing genitalia is period, and my Google search will never be the same. <laughs> my my uh, husband might have been gifted a book of Kakagami. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, and to go with this, of course, the text because of the picture is very suggestive. You know, very very suggestive. Um, and poor Fia was Harold. And oh, I warned her and she read through it. She thought she was okay. But no, no, no. She just, there's, there's, a, there's a video out there somebody's got of her trying to read the scroll. And she gets through a bunch of it. And then she loses it and she recovers. And their majesties have lost it. It's actually Damon and Veronique at the time. And they've lost it. Uh, and the, the we're not showing you guys the scroll. This is a family event. Um, but yes, uh, without... Uh, if you can't move the box, I think we'll be okay without moving the box. Okay. <laughs> um, unless you want to try to, I mean, you could probably click on it and, and uh, move it, maybe or not, either it, way. It, it's seriously not letting me, like, I don't know. Huh. Yeah, yeah, not letting me. We'll, we'll, I'll share it with you later. <laughs> okay. We'll look at your hats. My hat. So as you, I'm wearing one of these hats. Uh, so I love a good hat. Um, a bunch of other people love a good hat too, but I have quite a variety of hats. Um, the, and, and, I, and they're period. It's not like I'm just making this stuff up. So the Pilgrim badge hat also has been called the disco ball is covered with a large number of various site tokens and appreciation badges and a few awards and then actual Pilgrim badges from actual pilgrimage to actual medieval sites that I've done over the years. Um, and so the hat, the hat's got quite a, you know, everything's got a story. It's like, oh, that's from this event, and that's from this thing, and that's that's the that's an award, and that's that, and that kind of stuff. Um, the 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 other hat people like to call the pizza hat or the Guinan hat um, uh, is an Italian. It's an Italian uh, outfit, and it, you know the, the fabric's great. It was so funny because the first time I was going into an event, I didn't have the hat on. Somebody's like. I've noticed the fabric is gorgeous. I'm like, you're the only person who's going to notice the fabric. They're like, why? And I put on the hat. They're like, 
Yep. <laughs> um, it's got violins on it, so that's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, it's a, it's an Italian from 1600. <laughs> kind of a big long coat with uh, the open sleeves, and you know, a big you know, it's a great hat. And then uh, the 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 next hat is my Uden hut. Um, that's actually the outfit minus the hood uh, that I that I had for my when I got Laurel. Um, but it's uh, very much, uh, as far as I know, and things that may have changed since last I found out. There's only one other person in all of the SCA who has actually made a Uden hut um, like that. What and culture is that from? That's German. So it's it's a Jewish hat from in this case from Germany. So. The backstory here is that you know Jews in, in Europe didn't necessarily meet with the most uh, egalitarian and uh, equal rights kind of a culture, and so one of the things they were forced to do was wear bright yellow hats when in public, so people knew that there was a Jew walking down the street. Well, the Jewish community, like it's wont to do, um, it's like fine, we're going to make these ostentatiously awesome hats. <laughs> you can't miss. Um, and, and, and you'll see hats like this in manuscripts. You know, it's, it's very easy to find them. There's a bunch of great books out there. For those who are interested in Jewish costuming, uh, there's a bunch of really great books on Jewish costuming out there. And uh, so the hat had to be bright yellow. And that one is. And that one's actually salted wool. I, I, I made it. Um, I salted the wool myself. Thank you to my friend, Mr. Santania and uh, put it together. And yes, the, the top is sticking up with a wire in it to keep it vertical, but yeah, that's salted wool, bright yellow, dyed myself, and uh, it's quite the hat. That's really cool. It actually looks a lot like some of the hats from my culture and time period. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Um, my brain is working a lot right now about that hat. <laughs> I'll have to send you some pictures. <laughs> So other things that I do, um, I do archery. That's me tilted way back in the center there, shooting way up in the air. Um, uh, I was actually the second, I think, kingdom archery champion of Artemisia. Um, the side story there is when I got to Artemisia, there was no archery. So I said, I want there to be archerist. I went to the king and said, we should have archery. He's like, then you do it. So I was like, okay. And so I was the first uh, archer general of the kingdom. I wrote the handbook. I got the martial program going. I, you know, made things happen, got the championship going, got it added to Kingdom Law, um, and now it's, it's a thriving uh, archery corps in the kingdom, which makes me very happy. That's super cool. And so as a result, I shoot archery and then, of course, make arrows. So I've made dozens and dozens of arrows. These are some of the gift arrows. Um, these are actually three sets that were gift arrows to their majesties going to Australia. It was actually for Yuri and Samea for them to shoot at Australia with new arrows for both of them. And then the set in the back was for the Baron of Loxalan at the time, Hogar, a good friend of mine. And he, I figured some black, you know, some nice heraldic arrows for the barony would not go amiss. So yeah, you've got uh, good looking arrows to take the war. Very cool. Do you teach an arrow making class? We, I do. Um, actually, we have run a Fletching Guild in the barony. I have quite the setup. And so people come over and basically, um, I let people, I, with my guidance, people build their own dozen arrows um, and they come out of it having built a dozen arrows so they can take them home and shoot them. And then knowing, cause you've gone through all the steps, how to repair, how to replace and going forward like that. So it's really fun. It's for a while there when we had the flushing guild going strong and we go to archery practice on a regular, when we had a regular running archery practice back, you know, when we could meet people, um, it was fun to go up to the target and see all these different kinds of, you know, varieties of arrows in the target, knowing that all of them were made in my garage. Um, wow. So it's really fun. You know, it's a consumable item, but they are such pretty stuff. Yeah. I have an apprentice who is really into this and he's fairly new in his journey. And maybe we will have to come visit you. Yep. I got all the stuff. Um, I, I, what's interesting is these all plastic knots. I've done self knocks. I do plastic knocks. I do them both. The, my philosophy on this is if you're shooting them for practice, plastic knocks are just fine because all you need is somebody to clip a knock with a, with a, their arrow. And if it's plastic, you just cut it off, put a new one on, you call it good. If it's the wood ones, then the arrow's done, um, which is really a bummer. Uh, so. Makes sense to me. So uh, 
there's a bunch of things going on in this space, you know, here. So the first one is on the left, a waxed linen. I, and this kind of leads into I, some of the many, many classes that I have taught about just everyday things. We did a very fun hands-on make your own wax linen class uh, at a collegium where I supplied the linen and I had, I used the hot iron and the aluminum foil method to, you know, get, and people walked out of there with their own pieces of wax linen to, to do whatever with and the knowledge how to do it, right? I'm like, this is really easy, folks. Uh, my philosophy when I teach these classes, like if it's hard, they wouldn't have done it because they didn't have time to do hard things. They were busy. Uh, you know, doing the basic things that we take for granted. Yep. Uh, so you, know, you can see there, I've got different sizes. I've got a, a jar with a piece. I've got a piece of bread that I can wrap up. Um, the, the second picture here is uh, my personal achievement. And it's not in there just to toot my own horn, but to talk about that's something that I do a lot of is creating personal achievements for people um, for our household. Um, and it'll be the, it's, it's the next slide and I'll get there. Um, I did a personal achievement for everybody. And we made a tapestry out of it because um, I do them in high enough resolution that, uh, you know, you can, what I found out is that for, at Zazzle, you can put whatever you want on one yard of fabric for 30 bucks. So if you, so if you want to do this and, you know, for your group or yourself or your kingdom and you make it so it's 36 inches wide, you can make yourself a tapestry of that for 30 bucks. And so... <laughs> Yeah, if you think about it, you know, 30 bucks a yard is a lot for fabric, but if you're buying one yard and the end result is a tapestry to put up as decoration with that, then that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, and, and the time that you would spend uh, painting or embroidering that um, would be much more than $30 worth of time. So. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to do that. Um, I also have a lot of fun um, designing up pendants and stuff for folks. Um, the pennant down there is our Western Artemisia pennant. We fly it at Honor War um, because Honor War is held in Western Artemisia. Why are you using our checky? Uh, because it's Western. Well, it, it used to be part of Ontier, but now it's Western Artemisia, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> We're just identifying it for what it is instead of black lions or black griffins. And and it's 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 just Western Artemisia. It's fine. Don't Nothing to see here. I don't know if those are enough points of difference or whatever it is. It's all good. Well, it's, it's part of our kingdom. We claim honor war. So, I mean, okay, <laughs> um, I'm not trying to start a war or anything. They've already got um, it. I, I really love this. I, I uh, Octavisades and I finally managed to get our devices passed a few years ago, but we don't have like the whole achievement thing going on. And oh, no. I, I'm just starting to do a little research into what all of that stuff means and it's it's really cool well i got i got hot and heavy into it and realized that we didn't have any kingdom rules so i kind of bullied cajoled forced our kingdom principal harold to come up with rules for it I'm like so what are the rules he's like we don't have any i'm like well either you can come up with some or i can come up with some he's like fine i'll come up with some so um you know, we actually have a handbook on achievements and what goes on, hand, on achievements and what you can have and what at what level of award rec you get what. And so Artemisia has got a fairly developed uh, system for that. And so, yeah, that's. But, on here might as well. I have no idea, but now I'm going to go research it. So what what you see here on the left is what is the latest iteration of the household tapestry. Um, with everybody in precedence order, but you can kind of see the company say Jude um, with all of the members. And, you know, it's, I love my household. We are a bunch of all stars, if it, you were, if you will. Um, we have a lot of peers. We have a lot of Griffins of Artemisia. We have a lot of court baronies or other shiny hats on people, as I like to say. Um, but it's 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 a it's a great group, and that's the the picture on the right there is the picture we took uh, at a twenty year of the of what I've really come to see as my family. Um, everyone's got their place in it, and we make a lot of weird things happen. Um, but it always comes out really cool. You know, we've we've everyone in here has been playing for quite a, a long time, and so you know I think. 50 year was the, the first great example of our camp coming together. We had this amazing camp at 50 year 
um, of you know period pavilions with this courtyard and sunshades and man and we had snubberies up that were which were really nice you know Kel, you've seen Kelwin's I'm sure she takes it everywhere and so everyone's got one and it just creates this magical place and it's it's just a great family and I really appreciate everyone in there for what they bring to make it more. It's really awesome. And a very welcoming group of people, I have to say. So just a few random pictures here. Uh, the, uh, so the one on the left, so this was cool. Um, it was quite the summer. In 2015, uh, my wife and I uh, went to the 600th anniversary of Agincourt at Agincourt. And we dressed up for it because you can. Uh, and we had a blast. That was amazing. Um, and, you know, you go to events here and you think the shopping is, you know, there's good shopping, right? You go to some events, there's some great shopping. No, we are not even, this is minor Bush League here. Every place there was top end, like, wow, shopping. There was none of that chintzy, low end stuff. You're like, eh, hey, we'll just move on. Thanks for that. No, you, they had like authentic pieces of padded armor you could pick, you, you know, the, the actual stuffed linen, you could pick up the pieces. Um, you just, there was hoods, my current pouch I got there and it was such a, it was, I couldn't say no. It was a great deal, it looks amazing, but it was just, the shopping was so good. And then the reenactment and on seeing the, the, the camp layouts and stuff like that was just, just phenomenal. And so we look good and it was, but it was, it was a great experience. And if, if you get the chance to go to one of the European historic festivals like that, go, because it's cool. It's like <clears> a whole other level. Yeah, it is really a whole nother. They, they, they do it good. So here um, I'm standing holding the Royal Scepter. Uh, so it's kind of come become a tradition in the kingdom. So the, the King's Justice, the sword of state can only be held by knights, dukes, and the king, right? That's the only people who can hold on to it. Well, it's kind of become tradition that the queen's scepter is only held by the queen or members of the Order of the Laurel. And so there's me, there, there I am standing court uh, holding the scepter. And then next to me is, um, turns out is my heraldic grandson, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Bacon. He's a master of defense holding queen's grace, which is the rapier sword. So it's kind of fun that there's, you know, regalia there and, and family is kind of, this is, this is me. Uh, so uh, another picture of me and my ear, my ear is getting into, my daughter is getting into archery and is enjoying it. We'll hopefully get back to doing that. And then this, this uh, last picture is my college friends from the way back college pictures. That's, that's uh, Tatiana there in the, uh, next to me in the front. You know, but many, many years later, this is taken just a few years ago at Battlemore. Uh, and just how we've all kind of grown up and gotten older and, you know, kept doing our thing. Um, but it, it, the friendships have always been so great. Is that it? That's all the picture. I mean, there's other pictures kind of loose in the folder. I don't know if you want to dig into those or not, but... Um, but yeah, these kind of these pictures here. Also, there's a bunch of bits of classes, things and things that I do. Um, so yeah, there's there's my Blackworks design. There's reading a medieval calendar. There's, I just taught last month, uh, Pilgrimage to Canterbury. So back in February in the, we're all stuck at home and hating it. Um, we ran a virtual pilgrimage to Canterbury and it, it's a big slideshow. We don't have to go through it, but. Okay, I'm um, like, not letting me pull it up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so what, 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 over the course of the month of February, it was, all right, it's about 75 miles from London to Canterbury, the way we walked it. And if you, for the month of February, if you average just under three miles a day, you can get there. And so we had <clears throat> um, 70 or so people join in and actually get out and go walking. And so what I did is I, I, you know, had a Facebook group and we went through to stop by stop and, and you can kind of see 
by geography why the, the the pass went the way it did. And then I put a bunch of pictures in from the journey, what you would see, the churches you would stay in, um, and just kind of going through the experience. And even today, you there's sections of Pilgrim's Way that still exist, um, especially once you get past Dartford and you turn the corner, you kind of, as you can see in that middle picture there, that's actual, that's the actual Pilgrim's Way today. Wow. That you can, um, so you can still do the pilgrimage. And then in Aylesford, which is a town further along, there's still the car, there was, and then it was kind of given away and then given back a Carmelite uh, Abbey where they still have the pilgrim house. This, this, here we go. In Aylesford, the Carmelite Friary, uh, that middle picture is the Pilgrim's Hall, restored, still used for pilgrims today. And then that's the picture of it from above looking out over the river there. And so a few of us are talking, wouldn't it be, because if you think about it at, at a normal speed, it's about 10 days walk, okay? So going to England and taking 10 days and walking from London to Canterbury, and then taking the train back, not walking, but taking the train back, um, would be this fun, you know, experience where you get to see all these cool churches. There's, you know, still 15th century stained glass in that one. Um, you know, once you get to Canterbury, see, there's still on High Street, there's still several buildings that were, the, the hospital, because hospital then meant hospitality for pilgrims and stuff like that. So one of the hospitals is still there. You can you can see and then seeing Canterbury Cathedral and what it looks like now versus what it looked like when there was actually the shrine in there before Henry VIII took it all out. <laughs> um, this, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, you can see the indents in the steps that have been worn away because people would climb the steps on their knees to go around the shrine. So wow. over the years, they've worn those steps, those grooves into those steps by all the people traveling that route. That's so cool. Um, near on the beach where we grew up, um, there was a like a big rock that had um, holes in it where the um, native um, peoples, indigenous peoples, had ground their food. Yeah. And there were steps going up, and you know you're barefoot because you're on the beach, and you can feel your feet want to turn where feats for you know hundreds and thousands of years have turned up the steps it's so amazing yeah it was it was it was really neat to 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 learn about and then share all this information about uh canterbury and the pilgrimage and becca and then finding these cool pictures on how the cathedral how it looked over the years you know it, it didn't look like it does now you know for much of period it was half the you know or two-thirds of the cathedral you know today right but they had to in stages yeah but it, and they just improved and what what always intri intrigues me is the number of times cathedrals get rebuilt because there's a fire you're like you think they'd be more careful no what happens is that people would get to stay in the church overnight and so they'd light a little fire and things get out of hand <laughs> well you know because because they would let the, the 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 pilgrims and the infirm stay in the churches right if you're on, if you're on your pilgrimage you know you get to stay in a church overnight that that and you get to do a free charge um, because you're on this religious a journey and they're like oh yeah stay here it's it's good for you and but you know people you know, let's set a little fire cook a little food maybe heat a little porridge oops <laughs> so, and so yeah the number of churches that there are two things that, that came out of this whole thing. One is the number of churches that caught fire is not because of carelessness, but because you have just people staying in the church all the time. And two, just how much of English church history was lost when Henry VIII did the dissolution. You know, so many, so many churches and so many abbeys and so many of those buildings were, you know, taken, you know, control from the church and then handed off or raised or everything sold off or whatever. And it's just astounding how much of that is gone. Yeah. But yeah, the, I, I do enjoy class, you know, I have a huge variety of classes 
that I, and if people ever wanted the, the handouts, I've, I've done a class on shopping in the Renaissance, you know, period shopping. You're like, oh, you know, I, I taught that one at Penzik and funny, it was a popular class. <laughs> uh, period table settings. Um, there's nothing that's so frustrating as, you know, people not knowing what makes proper table settings for feast. You know, like, well, I, I went to, to Goodwill and I bought a plate and I bought a fork and stuff like that. So, you know, what that one is fun because it helps people understand a few salient features about feasting. One is that unless you were Italian or Middle Eastern or, or, or something akin, you didn't have a fork, you know, but the food didn't need a fork. Um, and then candles on the table was not really commonplace. You're like, well, yeah, we always put candles on the table. No, they didn't. They had they had welded halls. They didn't need candles. Um, and then you shared napkins. You had a big long napkin across your side of the table, and it was you just shared it. No, <laughs> you had your own section. It's fine. You had your own sec. You had your own piece. It's not like you're you're sharing germs, but you know it's you have your you have your section. I think that some things are are better left in the past. <laughs> Fair. Fair. I, I have a feeling that um, Cortland might uh, agree with me on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, no, yeah, Cortland has her own. It's all good. <laughs> it's it's uh, it, it, but it, it, it's fun to see. You know, as we learn more things, and and, and everybody around keeps you know alert, learn a new tidbit, share this new tidbit. Um, part of that, you know, I've got a long running series in the Kingdom newsletter called Random Carp. Um, which, hey, now that you can read all of the newsletters online, you can go read all the, the random carp articles. Uh, you, uh, it's just, it's modern things that have a, a period source. And, you know, I've run through years and years of it and actually was fortunate enough to be recognized with the William Black Fox Award for last year um, for the random carp articles. So that was very cool. What is the name uh, rooted in? Random, which one, random carp? Yeah. Well, instead of call it random crap, it's random carp. Well, it's interesting because uh, in Ontario, the award for um, recognition of uh, somebody who's who's really into their persona and you know has well developed uh, cultural stuff is the, the Order of the Carp. Ah. Yeah, no, it was basically instead of talking about random stuff, random crap, random whatever else, I just call it random carp, which has just been a long, it's, it's been a fun article. It's, it's covered everything from um, why is it a dozen to, um, you know, where did the name acre, or why do we call it an acre, um, you know, things like that. Why do we do triplicate? That was one of the first ones. Why do we have triplicate forms? Um, where does ketchup come from? Ketchup's period, not like you know it, but ketchup is a very period. Uh, it was fish based, but yes, it was it was the most popular condiment. Still is the most popular condiment in the world. That they would make it in highly concentrated, very intense form in Southeast Asia, at a fish. It's a fish sauce, and then they would throw it in barrels and drag it back to Europe. Wow! So. And then they found tomatoes. Well, then they well. Tomato, ketchup made out of tomatoes didn't happen until the, the 19th century. There's a lot of interesting colonial cookbooks in the United States talking about making mushroom ketchup. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, okay. But yeah, so. That's earthy. <laughs> you're like, I don't, I don't know what to think about mushroom ketchup. I mean, I like mushrooms, but I don't, I don't know about ketchup. That, that might be pushing it. But uh, yeah, no, the Random Carp article has been a lot of fun because I learned Sorts, all sorts of interesting things. My favorite lately that uh, was published was the fact that, you know, Australia is, visiting Australia was not period, right? That didn't happen until James Cook went south. But there is actual evidence of Australians visiting Europe in the 1200s. Oh, wow. Yes. But it was, it was not a who, it was an it. It was a gift of a cockatoo to the Doge of Venice in the 12, in the in the uh, 13th century. Wow, so that means that some indigenous population came over and did that? Or most likely uh, the cockatoo, which 
based on the pictures, because we have images, really good images of a cockatoo, which is a very unique bird in Italy. Um, right. It was a gift from the Sultan of Egypt who got it from someplace east of there. So I'm guessing it kind of traveled from Southeast, from Australia to Southeast Asia, from Southeast Asia to India, from India through Persia to Egypt to, to Italy. And, you know, so before Marco Polo went to China, a cockatoo went to Italy. That's crazy. It's just fun things like that. You're like, wow, there's just so many cool bits of history that have become part of everyday life that you just don't think about. I love that you you are so into all of these little things and that you you um, are sharing all this information. It's, it's fun. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, it's, I like it. Well, and, and I think that the more we understand the base of what was what it was like to do things every day to day medievally it's much then it's much easier to live that way at events and doing all the right things you know the more we all make things from scratch and then we realize why you read some of these directions you're like that makes no sense and then you do it you're like okay no that actually does make sense because because they learned how to do it the right way they had to. They, they didn't have sewing machines and Home Depot and, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Going down the grocery store and getting it all pre-prepared. Right. I'm just going to, oh, I need some more cream cheese. I'll just, no, you got to take the whey, you know, take the milk and curdle it and run it through the cheesecloth. And, you know, it's when I made my first medieval cheesecake. You know, it's a platina has a great cheesecake recipe. I did that for my first Arctic Science Championship competition. Um, and he says, you take the cheese and it's a crumbly white cheese and you add it and you mix it with enough milk as would be enough. What is, what does that mean? Right. And so I start mixing in milk and then all of a sudden it becomes a, it becomes cream cheese. It has a consistency of cream cheese. I'm like, Oh, that's enough. That's now, enough. Now I've got cheesecake to make cheesecake or cream cheese to make cheesecake. There we go. So it's just, it's, it makes sense when you do it. And I think that's one of the great things about the SCA is in this society, you do things the way they did it and it makes sense. Yeah, and, and you don't need to reinvent it with some modern something something. Right. <laughs> and when we were building our yurt, um, my husband kept wanting to like re-engineer stuff and I'm like, no, <laughs> this is thousands of years of established engineering, do not mess with it. <laughs> It's, 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 it's your, it was interesting being, because uh, you mentioned your, I was at the, there was a Genghis Khan exhibit, a really good one about 10 years ago that came through Denver, and I got to go. And there were a few astoundingly interesting things about the exhibit that stuck, at, stuck in my mind. One was, you know, on their out, you know, on, on the clothing, they kept adding, as you wore out your cuffs, you just added a new layer of silk. I'm like, well, that's really that, Then you had the different colors as a result because you didn't necessarily have the same stuff. I'm like, well, that's really cool. And, you know, so you, you see, uh, uh, you know, along the, the the edges, you see a new layer, you know, thicker layers. I'm like, that that's that's smart. Um, and then the one that I still haven't been able to figure out why, but I took, I stared at it for like five minutes to the, the security guard. like, are you okay? Um, there was somebody with their shoes on, their boots on, and there is a seam down the middle of the shoe from toe to heel in the in the sole. Oh interesting. I see I was like I was like wait hold on and, I, and I'm looking at it going and, and looking at it from the sides did they mess something up? No these are these are the these are nice 13th century Mongolian boots on this person that didn't ever leave their feet. Um so I still haven't figured that one out but along the Along the bottom. Yeah, so, the so bottom. Like, if it was your foot, this is where the seam went. It was along here. That just seems wrong. I, you know, you're telling me. <laughs> like, that makes no sense. But I saw it. So I don't understand it. And then there was a, a saddle. They had a, an extent saddle that basically is a McClellan saddle today. I don't know if you're seeing it, but it basically is, is very much like a, a modern McClellan saddle. You're like, oh, okay. So. It's just rehashing a good idea. Gotcha. Um, I spent a long time staring with my nose against the glass, the arrows. I get told to step away. Um, <laughs> I figured that, but you know, it was it was 
it's it's I love the fact that we're getting more of these exhibits coming through the cities, like the Viking exhibit that just made its tour through a couple of years ago. It was great to see all that stuff. It's in Bozeman now. Yeah, I saw it when I was in Denver. Um, of course, then when it, when we went on our Italy Switzerland trip, um, due to plane issues, long story short, due to the Max Eight Seven Thirty Seven Max Eight problems. Um, we ended up with a 22 hour layover in Reykjavik. So, went in Reykjavik, go to the Iceland National Museum. Um, <laughs> so, we went there, so, it was two museums. One was the uh, 932 or 930, something, 832, I think was the name of the museum, which is really cool because it's a hut, a, a longhouse structure that they've excavated and stuff like that. And they have computer recreated images of what it looked like and how to build it. And I took lots and lots of pictures. I'm like, you know, if anybody has some space, we could build ourselves an authentic Icelandic ninth century hut for whatever, just saying. Um, and then I went to the Iceland National Museum and just kind of crawled my way through all of the good stuff. So fun. I, uh, I miss going to museums. It's something I have to do on my own because my family is not into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we actually went to DC a couple of years ago and uh, I went back, like they all came back to the Airbnb that we were at and I went back and visited on my own so that I could just stay. Because <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't handle it. For, for anyway. what, yes. And for whatever reason, the only time I go to the VNA in London is when I'm jet lagged. My wife and I both have a track record. The day you land, you take a nap, and then you go to the VNA where you're horribly jet lagged and really tired. Because that's the best way to in intake information. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, is there anything that we haven't talked about tonight that you wanted to talk about? I don't think so. Um, I've got, as, as you can see behind me, I've got various instruments. I mean, I could spend a couple seconds talking about the fact that. There is the viola da gamba that I play. Um, here is a viol that I play. So, um, like I said, violin. Violins are over here. I've got two of them here. I've got the Baroque violin and the and the modern violin. Um, for depending on what I'm doing, and this is a re rebec over here and a mandolin, bullback mandolin. And the the mandolin actually is, is an antique of itself. It's it's about a hundred and something years old. Um, but you don't get many bullback mandolins today generally um the fun thing about man you know the nice bowl back so we can knock knock everything over here we go yay um this yeah it's got the nice bowl back but it's it's a early it's an early 19 teens 1920 mandolin just um, beautiful yeah this is <laughs> this is one of those i don't know what's going to happen but we'll see what ebay gives us and it gave us a winner uh sounds great and so the, the fun part about mandolins has been period was the, the bull bat was a very um, uh, suggestive feature. The larger the bull on your mandolin or your lute, the suggestive of other items that are large and round and definitely worth exploring, I guess. Um, but, uh, uh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so I, I do like, you know, it's a nice strolling instrument for walking around and, and, and playing music. Um, I've got a, a couple of other instruments along those lines that are, that are downstairs I didn't bring up. But uh, yeah, I've got the Rebec there, which is, this one is a cheater Rebec. Uh, Rebecs are typically uh, carved out of one piece of wood and then just put strings across the top with a flat top. Um, this one's actually built like a normal violin would be, um, but it's it's got a very wide, heavy fingerboard, which gives it a much more mellow sound. Um, they've got the two violins there. Um, the, so these two... Um, in our music group, our local music group, um, I didn't usually have to play the, the bass line because, you know, it's, there's the top lines, middle lines, bottom lines. I usually play middle lines, you can't usually top lines. Well, then our cello player decided to move. So I ended up playing the bass line. So I've been doing a lot of VL and Viola da Gamba um, as a result. And so I've been just doing a lot, you know, playing with those two instruments more. So the VL is kind of tuned similar to a viola with an E string. And the viola, gamba, like I said, is, is very much like a cello. So you've got a nice mellow cello sound, viola sound, depending on what we're playing, what the range of the music is. Um, and then when I get to have fun, 
and goof off and, and, and be silly. It's definitely the violence. Very cool. Well, I'm just kind of blown away by all of your knowledge and all of the things you're into. It's so awesome. Um, thank you so much for sharing yourself with us tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> um, tomorrow, uh, my sister and I are uh, talking with uh, Her Ladyship Tessina from uh, the summits. Um, so we're really looking forward to talking to her. She's um, She's just amazing. She's uh, a super fun. Um, she takes a lot of really great photographs. Um, she's done a lot of community building and uh, culture nurturing in the summits that has been really important over the last few years. So I'm um, looking forward to talking to her. Um, thank you again for being one of my last three Laurel interviews. Um, I'm really glad that we got you in um, because this has been a total treat share and you know folks if you, if you want to learn more about all the crazy useless knowledge that i know or want me to share one of these classes i've got a, a an extensive list of random stuff <laughs> do you um is there a link that you can share maybe put up in the comments to uh contact you or to so i'll put a link up in the comments for sure okay awesome awesome well, thanks everyone for watching tonight and um, thank you again for your time and uh, all of your knowledge and uh, we'll see you all soon. Good night. <laughs>